Welcome. My name is Eddie Machtinger. For the past 20 years, I've been a primary care physician taking care of women living with HIV at UCSF. Hi, I am Alicia Lieberman. I am a psychologist, and for the past 25 years, I directed the UCSF Child Trauma Research Program at Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, where we treat traumatized, very young children and their families. This is the first of three short videos about how telehealth encounters in primary care can be surprisingly intimate and effective. I have found that integrating a few basic psychological principles of trauma and resiliency-informed healthcare can be a very helpful guide. These videos address three basic questions about how to put this into practice. This first video addresses a particularly timely question. What is our role now doing telehealth with patients during COVID? How is this role now different from what our typical role is as providers? Who are we in these encounters? There are two key roles that we play now. The first is obvious doing our best to protect our patients from COVID virus and helping them access care if they get sick. Our second role is less obvious, but no less important. And that's to protect our patients from COVID related stress that may exacerbate chronic medical and psychiatric conditions and lead to new ones. The concern here is that there will be a second wave of illnesses and death after COVID itself is contained and that we need to prevent that from happening now. Alicia, I wonder how you understand the way that trauma affects um, people and the role that we can play as healthcare providers helping people cope with it. I want to start with a framework showing that some form of stress is part of everyday life. When stress is expectable, moderate, developmentally appropriate, it is a necessary incentive that strengthens our emotional and cognitive muscles. It gives us energy to confront challenges and it actually brings oxygen to our brains. For example, children get stressed when they first start school, but this is useful stress that helps them grow when we help them with it. The stress we're all experiencing now in response to COVID-19 is not expectable, but it is adaptive because we need to anticipate threats to our health and we need to change our behavior to protect ourselves in rapidly changing conditions. Right now, those who don't feel situational stress are a danger, both to themselves and others. But when it gets too intense, it becomes emotionally disorganizing. At the extreme end of this continuum is traumatic stress, where we respond with fighting or fleeing or freezing because we're perceiving the danger as immediate and uncontrollable. Healthcare providers have a crucial role right now in helping their patients move from disorganizing and traumatic stress to adaptive and manageable situational stress. Yeah, Alicia, I've been seeing this play out in my practice every day. Um, in the past few days, I've had multiple patients call me with complaints of mild chest pain. And they're concerned that they are having COVID-related pneumonia or having a heart attack. And obviously, I have to listen to them carefully to ensure that they're not having either of these dangerous conditions. If it's pretty clear to me that they're not, letting them know this, that it doesn't sound like COVID or an MI, but rather anxiety and panic, that can be enormously reassuring, um, especially if they don't think I'm dismissing their concerns. I also try to destigmatize the way they're feeling by telling them that I have felt exactly the same way, because I have and that many other patients are calling with identical symptoms. Sometimes I'll prescribe a low dose of clonopin or alprazolam to see if it improves their symptoms. And when it does, we're both further reassured. Part 
of alleviating the harmful impacts of stress is also to check in with patients about how they're managing their chronic conditions. Because during times of stress, people have a really hard time keeping up with their medications, their diets, and their activity levels. And if there's privacy and trust, I'll also check in with them about whether anybody is hurting them or threatening them, or whether they're struggling with alcohol or substance use to deal with their anxiety. I find that these topics, which can feel so difficult to address in the context of a very busy primary care encounter, um, can be much easier to discuss in the context of a video encounter, which is more relaxed and the patient's often sitting comfortably at home. If a person does report domestic violence, there's a national uh, domestic violence hotline, um, the number of which is on the screen right now, that you um, can uh, call yourself or you can give uh, the number to the patient uh, to call him or herself for further information. Um, I end the session by telling them exactly how to reach me if things get worse so that I don't miss something more serious and so that they know that I, I'm there for them. The interventions that Eddie is describing model how to help patients move from disorganizing traumatic stress to manageable stress. First, we show them that we care, that we're interested in hearing about risky or worrisome conditions that may affect their health because we can do something about it. Second, we validate and normalize what they tell us to decrease fear and shame, which are major sources of patients' harmful stress. Third, we take specific actions to provide relief. And finally, we give a clear message that we remain available if they continue to need us, which makes them feel supported and valued. These strategies work well across all healthcare disciplines from primary care to behavioral or mental health. The more we practice them, the more they will become second nature to us.